Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today, spies, AI and a show from Japan. Make sure you wear it while you're in Moscow. Benedict Cumberbatch returns as an intelligence worker. We'll see how AI is changing the branding business. And good news for Instagrammers. Yayoi Kusama's new works land in New York. The espionage cinema of today is all about action and spectacle. But now, a new movie brings a fresh breath of air to the current roster of secret agents. Here's a peek at the courier. Sounds like work. No, tell them I'm in my chair. The courier finds actor Benedict Cumberbatch as businessman Gravel Wynn. He's approached by intelligence agencies to spy on the Soviets during the Cuban Missile Crisis. While James Bond and Jason Bourne are action heroes, Gravel Wynn is a different kind of agent. He's described as a, quote, boring civilian that nobody would suspect of ever being a spy. And according to critics, this is what makes the film unique among current espionage films. Gone are the overly lit sets and big action scenes that we see in today's movies. Instead, the courier reaches back to the grassroots of espionage fiction. It has a darkly lit atmosphere. It also has a hero with a low-key appearance, who wears a fedora hat and a long coat. Reviews champion Cumberbatch's performance as a nervy one that drives the film. And this acclaimed performance is based on the real-life exploits of Gravel Wynn, who lived long enough to write two books on his intelligence work. In his real job as an engineer, he traveled frequently to Eastern Europe. This made him the best candidate for spy work. And for MI5, he made several trips to Moscow. And the well-received cinematic outing of Wynn's exploits show one thing. Espionage cinema does not necessarily need mega-budgets and big-sized guns to attract attention. It seems fedora hats and dark rooms never go out of fashion. Let's bring in film critic Hope Madden. Hi there, it's, it's lovely to have you with us today. So, Thank you. Do you agree with what our producer Ali Jan just said? Is this movie you think strong enough to prove that espionage cinema doesn't necessarily need mega budgets and big sized guns to attract attention? You know, I, I think that there's something to that argument. You know, there's something, especially because the film is based on true events. I think people are always fascinated by these really wild stories from their own history that they didn't know about. And and I also think that people are always really engaged in an everyman kind of a story where some just, you know, guy off the street is plucked into this world that none of us ever thought that we could be involved in. It makes you feel like it could happen to you as well. Um, and so I, I do think that there's something to the idea that people are still interested in films like that, you know, even if they don't have sort of the, the budget and, and the kind of false lighting and big explosions of like your Mission Impossibles. Okay, why are we seeing a lot of these films with, you know, just like you said, overly lit sets and, you know, big guns? Why is this the trend now in espionage cinema? Oh, I just think that, um, you know, especially right now, as, as uh, <clears throat> we're struggling to get people back into theaters proper, I, I think that the reality is that the movies that make the most money are the movies that cost the most money. So, you know, if, if it's the superhero films or if it's the, you know, Fast and the Furious films, I think the um, espionage thrillers, they just follow suit and they make the biggest explosions and the wildest movies and the biggest event pictures, just like kind of all the other genres are doing. Okay, and does this excite you? I mean, uh, what do you think about today's spy movies? You know, I really like the idea of... <clears throat> of telling more of an everyman story. I think this, you know, it makes you think of of uh, imitation games, right? Um, Benedict Cumberbatch, other spy thriller or Bridge of Spies. 
you know, really high quality films that get you thinking. And I think that you become more invested in than you do in something like Mission Impossible, which I think is a very fun movie. I think the Bourne movies are very fun movies. Uh, but I think that given the, you know, the serious nature of this kind of a film, something a little bit more dialed down like Tinker, Taylor, Soldier Spy, I think that's always going to have an audience. Mm -hmm. And um, and do you think will we have more, you know, such classic style espionage films that bring an alternative to, you know, James Bond and Bourne movies? Yeah, you know, I love the question and I hope so. It doesn't. It doesn't look very promising, though. Um, if you look ahead at the, the slate of films that are supposed to come out for the next couple of years, you know, you don't see any. There are none on there. Um, and But the other problem is it. So we had two back-to-back -back films like this. True Stories, uh, you know, espionage thrillers come out of England, The Courier, and also Six Minutes to Midnight. Um, the Courier has been out for about a month. It's made a total worldwide of seven million dollars. And Six Minutes to Midnight made less than half a million dollars. And you can't hold that against it entirely in this particular year because they were only released theatrically and very few people are going to theaters. But but still, the the really weak box office turnout doesn't kind of speak well to the, the possibilities for film like this. Mm -hmm. And OK, coming back to Korea, would you say that it is an A list spy thriller? I wonder what your overall take on the movie is. You know, I enjoyed it. I don't think it is an A-list spy thriller. I think it keeps your attention the whole time. I think Benedict Cumberbatch uh, and Mirab Nainaj are great in it, and they, they generate a kind of camaraderie and a sort of a relationship that I think you don't expect in a film like this. But on the whole, I, I think it kind of lacked that um, ticking time bomb kind of urgency that you expect from a film like this. So, I mean, I thought it was a good movie, but I didn't think it was a great movie. What would make it great? Um, you know, I think that it, it kind of lacked in style a little bit. If you watch Bridge of Spies or even Imitation Game, you there was this felt like a very solidly but not uh, not sort of expertly crafted kind of a film. I think that also it felt a little bit off balance in that I think what it was really trying to do was to direct your attention to this relationship between these two people. And, and also between, I think, uh, Greville's relationship with his wife at home and, and those personal kinds of of conflicts, which felt out of balance with the life or death of the entire world sort of thrills of the espionage. Okay, Hope, I wonder what you think about Cumberbatch's performance. I thought he was great, mm -hmm. you know, and he always is. I can't, I can't think of a single film of his that I, that I would think, oh, he was, you know, the weak link in that. I mean, he's an incredibly talented actor and very committed to each role. And I think that he really, um, uh, brought some nuance to this idea of the salesman, right? That, that that's why uh, Greville was so attractive in this to, to the government because nobody was going to think that this guy was a spy. He was just a schmoozy salesman. And I think that that he did a great job of being somebody who really was misplaced in this environment, but in the end showed that he could handle it. Mm -hmm. And um, why was this movie made today? Do you think timing holds any sort of importance? I do, um, and I think it almost always does. Uh, and, and and you know when it's a, a a based on true events film, sometimes you think, well, maybe something was just recently declassified, and that's why. But that's not really the case. You know, uh, Garfield Wynn was kind of a public figure uh, until he died in 1990, so it really isn't that. I think that it's because the reason that Penkowski, the Soviet spy, was um, sort of encouraged to the, the, the reason he decided to share secrets with the world was because he felt that Khrushchev was an unhinged bully and had too much power and was likely to do something that couldn't be undone. And I feel like globally, that's not a very hard worry for us to recognize, especially over the last few years. Okay, so, I mean, you said spy films almost always hold a mirror to the politics of the time that they're made in. So uh, what would you say, what does this film say about the state world is in today? You know, I think that it is a hopeful um, kind of a statement that no matter how overwhelmed you may feel with the decisions that your leaders are making, that it really is in the hands of each, each person in each country to um, try to redirect your nation into, you know, and the world you know, to do the things that you feel are the right things. 
And, uh, and before we wrap up, I wonder, you know, uh, especially after what you said, do you think watching espionage movies uh, is generally an escapist thing to do? Because, you know, at the end of the day, they assure us that the struggles of our times uh, are going to be handled by these heroes that we sort of, you know, wish that we could be. I do think so. And I think that's one of the reasons why these everyman type struggles like this, like Bridge of Spies and like, you know, a lot of the old Hitchcock films where where or just some nobody is plucked into this wild world. I think that that's what it reflects. You know, it, it gives us to 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 a chance to sort of dream. I could do that. I could be a part of that. Well, OK, Hope Madden, it was lovely having you with us today. Thanks a lot. Thank you. It's hard to get movies past the censors in China, but director Derek Tsang hopes his film's better days will inspire others in Hong Kong to follow their dreams and tell stories about difficult topics. We hope that you know, our, our nomination in our film can inspire other young filmmakers. Well, I certainly hope that you know our film and the nomination can you know um, bring more more. Um, uh, Positivity and 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 you know a sense of um, hope for for young filmmakers. I don't think I'm particularly talented. I, I you know if I can make it, I hope that you know I, I believe because I believe there's a, a lot of really talented young filmmakers in Hong Kong. So you know if I can reach this goal, I'm I'm certain that you know other filmmakers can do too. <laughs> England has begun relaxing lockdown restrictions. It means Londoners are returning to the shops. And on Oxford Street, they're also getting a little art therapy as well. Without sounding too spiritual, but I, I, I think it's about unity. And I think that's what we all need, you know. It's like I, you know, I'm not a politician, I'm not, you know, I, I but like I like the idea of people having unity consciousness. And if I if I made an artwork that represented something about that, then I'll be happy about that. We've been focusing on public art for a while now, for a year or so. Uh, reason being is because, of course, museums and galleries have been closed for so long that the only way for the public to appreciate art and to feel art, to be inspired by art on, on their everyday life was public art. And uh, this is how the idea came about. And uh, for us, this really is uh, like a metaphor, you know. You can literally see the light at the end of the tunnel. In this next story, we meet Nikolai Ironov. It's a graphic artist behind hundreds of thousands of designs. And notice I said it's, because Nikolai is an artificial neural network, and this AI could pose a real challenge to its human counterparts. Let's see if that's true. Let's say you want a new company logo and reach out to a professional designer. Chances are you'll come across Nikolai Ironov, 
an artificial neural network. While most designers spend days, Nikolai takes only seconds to deliver what you want with a user-friendly approach. Interface. Nikolai's interface looks like communication, a kind of chat with a real designer. This is made specially this way for people to feel most comfortable working with a designer. Created by Art Lebedev Studio in Moscow, Nikolai has over 4,000 clients such as cafes, influencers, apps and consumer goods. All you need to do is give a short description of what you need and company details. And within seconds, Nikolai gives thousands of original design options. And if you're not satisfied, it can send more. If you look at the process of creation of any studio logo, you can see that the designer offers variations of the same thing. The solutions mean just moving something around a bit, changing colors a bit, spending hours on this, burning out as a result, spending his or her resources. Nikolai is not afraid of this. That's because Nikolai is not built to panic. The programming team has spent over a year to work out how the neural networks and simple algorithms could interact with each other. You can calm it down, so to say, so that it creates more quiet logos that people are more used to. But we deliberately put the sliders to maximum settings so that we could get something new. That was our main achievement. AI designers are in the market since 2016, but it was only last year that Nikolai was finally ready to handle elaborate projects, like designing for fashion brand Murmurism's clothing line. But when the company hired Nikolai, it didn't know it has hired a computer for the job. I was more than surprised. First of all, my first thought was, wow, we are the first fashion brand to collaborate with an artificial mind, with artificial intelligence, with neutral network. Really, it was so cool. Since its launch, Nikolai has helped people generate about 400,000 logos, of which 1,200 have been downloaded and used. And as algorithms get more and more efficient, the demand for AI designers are expected to increase. As long as it suits the customer, it's good, because there were both positive and negative feedback. But it's up to the client to choose. So if it helps it develop, including on this wave of hype related to the work of neural network, then why not? While ANNs provide unprecedented efficiency in commercial design, most designers believe that this technology will only become a tool in a human designer's kit. That is, unless it replaces the human altogether. Yayoi Kusama's career is an obsession over nature. So much so that even though the 92-year-old lives in a psychiatric hospital in Tokyo, she has a new show in New York. Japanese artist Yayoi Kusama counts abstract impressionism among her many influences, as well as pumpkins. The first time she laid eyes on one was while walking through her grandfather's vast nursery. And since then, she considers pumpkins, flowers, and even peas among the ordinary flora she uses as subjects for her extraordinary art. Covering more than one square kilometer, the exhibition Kusama Cosmic Nature at the New York Botanical Garden taps into this more organically minded sensibility. The show features four entirely new works of art, as well as many of Kusama's signature polka dot designs, this time covering sculptures of giant root vegetables as well as flowers. The show follows Kusama's progression as an artist through the natural world, which she sees as a joyful and colorful inspiration. There's a piece called Dancing Pumpkin that I hope that you'll see. Um, it's a huge pumpkin with um, sort of tentacles dancing around. And um, that was a real surprise. That was made specifically for the garden. It's not been seen anywhere else. And it's perfectly sited on the lawn outside of the conservatory. The exhibit was originally scheduled for March 2020, but it was delayed due to the coronavirus pandemic. But now visitors to the show can celebrate the return of New York's cultural life with a trip through Kusama Cosmic Nature. 
I think a lot of us have been craving that feeling of, of being inspired by something bigger than us. And it's been, a, it's been a rough year, and no one's really felt inspired. And um, I hope that everyone's inspired by this exhibition. It's colorful, it's fun, it's um, larger than life. But even as some people start to leave their homes now that lockdown measures are being lifted, Kusama remains in hers, a psychiatric hospital in Tokyo, where she's voluntarily lived since the late 1970s. These days, she is confined to a wheelchair and unable to travel. So while Kusama won't be able to see the fruits of her artistic labor in New York in person, she's helping plant the seeds of joy so others can. It was the 1920s. Artist and poet Etel Adnan spent her childhood across the Mediterranean in today's Turkey, Lebanon and Syria. She's been based in the U.S. for a while now, but a new show in Istanbul welcomes her back. Well, sort of. Sena Arslan has more. Some artists come with a background so diverse, it's hard to pin down their culture. Etel Adnan is one of them. She was born in Beirut in 1925. Her mother was a Greek from Izmir, her father an Ottoman staff officer. Etel went to Paris to study philosophy during the Algerian independence and later moved to the United States at the height of the Vietnam War to pursue a PhD. Soon after, she'd leave again and traveled back to Beirut. It was the 1970s and the country was plunged into civil war. Etel Adnan was born into a multicultural family. Migration and exile shaped her identity. And this cultural richness was eventually expressed in her art. At the age of 96, Adnan's work spans over 60 years. Some of them, including her most recent work, are here at the Para Museum's new show, Impossible Homecoming. Did she also think it was kind of a homecoming? Uh, sort of. I mean, she was very much interested with what is going on in the art world in Turkey, in the politics in Turkey, and so on. But also, she was very much willing to see Izmir, where um, her mother was born. She even proposed me to uh, arrange a sailboat from Marseille and go to Izmir. You can imagine. One of Adnan's early inspirations is Eastern carpets. And that's just one among a host of disciplines she's been practicing. She became a painter in the 1960s and later delved into literature, tapestry, video and ceramics. Her abstract compositions are bright and evoke lightness. Uh, what is striking is not something which is coming out of the blue, but it is rather her simplicity. The way she expresses very much complicated or sophisticated phenomena with a very simple style. This goes also with the way she uses color or the way she takes a leporello, a Japanese uh, notebook, to make a whole story, you can read from both ends. Sarhan stresses that Adnan's primary interest was with the world itself. A true homecoming wouldn't mean belonging to one country, but the whole world. We are all bound to be um, migrants in this world, somehow. And uh, her interest is not only, uh, let's say, uh, the politics itself, or the ideologies, or whatever, but also the earthly things, let's call them. The spring, the seasons, but also the constellations. Uh, that is why I think there is this, I wouldn't use the word hope, but this uh, spontaneity in her work. And to understand that al means to consider her written work. It is... Um, poetry within the images, but images as poetry as well. 
her books are also a sign of the way she sees the world. So, I mean, trying to understand that the world of an artist is not limited to what she produces, but more than that. In the case of Etel Adnan, art goes beyond her work, nourished by her roots spreading in multiple directions. Sena Arslan, TRT World, Istanbul. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter accounts have more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Elif Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.